In this video, we're going to manipulate the geometry from Fusion 360 and create a 3D lattice structure in Blender. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning back in and this is the third video in this mini-series where we're talking about bringing parametric designs from Fusion 360 into Blender for further modifications. Now I've already mentioned that you can do lots of different stuff in Blender. You can create animations, you can do particle simulations, you can do rendering, and generally the workflow is going to require something that you can't do in Fusion easily or even at all, and you want to do that in Blender. So creating this 3D lattice structure is something that you currently can't really do easily in Fusion 360. You can do it manually using form tools, but we want to talk about hacking something up and just seeing what we can do with it. So at this point, we've got our simple box that we brought in as an OBJ file. I've specifically gone into edit mode and decimated it, took it down to 0.26 with the decimate tool. And now we want to create a particle system. We want to use cell fracture, and then we're going to begin to create a wireframe representation of this boundary. So the first thing that we want to do is make sure that you have that object selected, your simple box. Then you're going to go into the modifiers, select add modifier and particle system. Once you add that, you need to then go to the particle properties, and then we're going to define a few things in here. We're going to go to the source. We're going to say that we want this to be sourced from the volume of the object, and the distribution is going to be a grid. Now the reason that we want to do that is because we want to represent this as a grid pattern of vertices. I'm going to scroll down to viewport display and I'm going to hide the emitter and I'm going to increase the size of these particles. So up here in the top properties you'll notice that the number of the thousand has grayed out and now the resolution of the grid is going to be my important setting. So if I play through this animation you're going to see that it's going to start creating those grid vertices, those elements, through the model. And just because of the general properties of the particle system, gravity is pulling those down after they get created. Now, the fact that they're getting created over a certain time in the timeline is not really important to us. We can modify those parameters if we want. We can make them live for 200 frames which means that they won't disappear after 50 frames. They'll fall for a bit farther before they disappear. So those properties are kind of cool to kind of important when we start actually making particle system animations, but right now they really don't matter to us. The orientation and the layout of those from the volume are really going to be the important settings. So let's bring the emitter back so we can see that whole volume. And now that we've created those particles, we're going to use that cell fracture that we added. So sometimes when we create these add-ons, it can be hard to find where they are. So the default search bar in Blender is the F3 or Function 3 key. I also have it set up to my space bar. And then you can just simply type in C-E-L-L. -L. So anytime you're searching for something, for example, join, you can see that this is in the object dropdown and control J to use that. With cell fracture you can see that this is in the object and it's listed under cell fracture. So we can use the object drop down and we can take a look for it in here. Again sometimes it can't be easily found by just looking for that which is why I like to go in and sometimes use that search bar. But you can see quick effects, quick fur, explode, smoke, liquid, cell fracture is listed here. So we're going to use cell fracture. I'm going to drag it up to the middle of the screen and I want to take a look at some of the options that we have. As we look at the sources, we can use the vertices that are on the object that we're dealing with, child vertices that belong to the object, we have particles and child particles, and then we have this annotation grease pencil. Because we made those particles, we want to use own particles. So these are the particles that belong to the object. We added that modifier, we made a particle system, that's what we want to use. We have some recursive shatter options. 
Right now, the randomization is set to 0.25, which means that we're not just going to get this thing hacked up in a grid, just like the particles are set up. It's going to have some sort of randomization for it. You really need to play around with these settings to get the output that you want. But thankfully, we can use undo and redo, and we can just play around with them. So let's leave all these settings as is, show progress real time, and say OK, and take a look at what we have. So it hacks up this original simple box into all of these different cells. If I use Control Z to undo, notice that the box has disappeared because it still thinks that I'm undoing the emitter setting as well as that cell fracture. So I'm going to go back to cell fracture, and this time I'm going to change that randomization number down to something smaller, and I'm going to say OK. And now there's less randomization of those boxes. Again, it's based on those particles. It's connecting them. If we decide to, again, undo, I will have to show that emitter again, go back into cell fracture. This time if I decide to use the vertices and fracture it, it's going to be broken up based on those triangles that we used. And in this case, because my model is decimated, I have less than the original. So again, control Z one more time, show emitter, go back to cell, use own particles. I'm going to set that randomization back up to 0.25, and I'm going to say OK and let it hack the model up. But I just want to point out that a lot of the times these settings might not be instantly apparent what they do. So going back and forth, just trying a few things can be important. At this point, I also want to highlight something. Up inside of my collections, I'm going to click on the eyeball for the simple box V1. And note that the cell fracture doesn't include all of the solid. There are holes in this because it's not perfectly chopped up. So if we want to maintain the original, then we should keep it in the model. If we don't want to maintain the original, then we should hide it, delete it, get rid of it, and just use these cell fractures. For my example, I'm going to get rid of them, but I'm going to select all of these and I'm going to try to join them together. Join is under our object dropdown, and notice that join is currently grayed out. It's not going to allow us to join these together. If I just select one object and select join, it says there's no mesh data for me to join. If I go back in here, notice that join was now an option. It wanted me to select one of those cells first, then box select everything else, and then it allowed me to join them. The original is still in here, and I can keep it, or I can right click and I can get rid of it. I can uh, select it first, and then I can right click and delete it if I wish. But now what we've done is we've taken all of those original cells, we've joined them together, and now we can go into edit mode and we can modify them a bit further. You might be wondering why we need to modify them since we've already modified this thing a couple times. Well, we've fractured it up into a bunch of individual cells, which means that since we joined it together, there are a lot of duplicate faces, a lot of duplicate vertices, and this is going to affect us downstream. So back in edit mode, again, tab, once you have your object selected or you can use the drop down, we're going to go into mesh, clean up, and we're going to select merge by distance. Now again, it has this little box that we need to select. We need to expand it. And I'm going to really decrease this number to 0.1. And notice that over 2,000 vertices were joined. And I can go back out to object mode. And now I can work with this thing knowing that I've combined a bunch of those overlapping geometries. The next thing that we want to do is add a modifier to this. Still selected, we're going to go to add modifier. We're going to create a wireframe. At first it doesn't look like much, but if we increase the thickness, what you'll start to see is that we have a bunch of these little tubes. Some of them are going outside of the object, so if we take a look at our settings, we need to restrict it to the boundary, and I'm going to turn off this even thickness. And what we've done is we've created this thin wireframe representation of that original object that we modeled in Fusion 360. We're not quite done yet, There's still a lot more that we can do to it. A couple other cool tricks that I learned from uh, the blog that's linked in the description. The Roman Ranner, he has, again, a lot of cool workflows that you can do in Blender. I want to make sure that I give him 
credit because this workflow comes from him, comes directly from his blog. I've made a few tweaks after talking with him, but uh, make sure you do check out his stuff. There's a lot of other cool tips and tricks that he's got for you guys to follow. But from here, uh, the next step in the process is to either add another modifier to subdivide this and smooth it out, or we could do another cool trick that I learned from him where we can create a vertex group. Basically what we're doing is we're saying everything selected, all the vertices that belong to this simple box. We're selecting those, we're making a group. Then inside of my modifier, I can select that group, and then I can use this factor to make a variable thickness wireframe. Now in order to do this, we need to give this model some more information. So we're gonna go from object mode into something called weight paint mode. And in weight paint mode, we're going to use a color gradient to define where we want those areas of high concentration and low concentration. I'm gonna make some changes. I'm gonna increase the radius of my paintbrush tool. The strength is maxed out at one and the weight is maxed out at one. So I'm gonna just simply draw over this back corner using my middle mouse button to press down and rotate this model. And then I'm just using the left mouse button to paint over these cells. All right, so now I have this sort of red area, this red area of high stress concentration and the yellow and green fading to blue. So once I'm done with that, I go back to object mode and notice that now most of my model has disappeared. With the factor set to zero, only the elements that have the weight, in this case the red color, are going to be created on the screen and they sort of fade away. Using this factor, we can bring the rest of the model back and it's going to respect those values, the weighted color, the weighted paint that we used. So now we've got a thicker area on the right and we've got a thinner area on the left. So that's a pretty cool trick. And if you're working in Fusion, you can create a simulation of your object and you can use those results to try to replicate the color bar that you see in Fusion to give you those high areas of concentration on uh, areas of high strength that are needed. So the last step in this process is to add another modifier and I'm gonna do a subdivision surface. Once we add the subdivision surface, this is starting to create this lattice or this mesh design that we're looking for. I'm gonna increase the viewport resolution. I'm gonna bump this up to three. And note that everything in this modifier stack is building on itself. So the wireframe is created before the subdivision surface. So any changes I make here, for example, increasing the thickness or making adjustments to those parameters, that happens before the subdivision. You have to be careful, depending on the complexity of your model and the power of your computer, that you don't go in and start cranking things up and expect it to just work. Sometimes you might crash your computer. So make sure that you do save often. And it's always better to have the resolution value set lower. It can update much quicker. And since I mentioned it, let's go ahead and just do a quick save just in case we happen to crash this. So now I can modify this thickness value much easier. I can also go back and I can get rid of that subdivision surface. I can tweak this. I can get rid of the group and not use that factor so we're dealing with a consistent thickness. And then I can come back and I can reapply that subdivision surface. Really just depends a little bit on your model, on your workflow, and what updates better for you. Uh, we can also change some other properties in here. We've got um, different things that we can adjust. For example, the render engine that I'm using is Eevee. This really isn't gonna have much of an effect, but you do have settings, for example, the sampling rate in the viewport and the render. A lot of times, especially when we're dealing with particles, modifying those parameters can have a big effect. So from here, this is really the state that I'm gonna leave this model in. The intent here is, is really not to do a full dive into Blender, but to make sure that we understand the process of going from Fusion 360 to an OBJ file into Blender, and then showing you a sample of a workflow of something that you could or might want to do to that model. So again, this has created this sort of lattice wireframe element, some takeaways from this. 
you could have a, a thin wall skin on the outside of this. You could maybe combine this lattice structure. You could make changes to things like the way that you're using a cell fracture. You can do it based on the vertices. You can manipulate the way that the particle system's created. You can change the way that the wireframe thickness, uh, whether or not you're using a group and the factor and the weight paint. But in the end, this is a pretty cool model. This is something that you could uh, carry on, maybe create an additive part, 3D print it if, you, if it meets all the requirements for you. But it's definitely something to consider and to play with. From here, I do have plans to do more Blender tutorials. I want to cover things like uh, particle simulation, things that we might want to do or see, again, with a CAD model from Fusion 360, bring it in, use it as an object in a particle simulation, maybe flow through an object. I also want to talk about rendering, things that we might want to do with our Fusion models in Blender. If you guys like this, please let me know, leave a comment. If the, the way that I explain stuff in Blender makes sense, if it doesn't, if I completely miss the mark here, let me know, and I'll try to tailor these to make sure that the information is as helpful as possible. But make sure that you do save your file, play around with all these settings, and just have fun with it. Blender is a fun program. There's a lot of functionality in it. You can do quite a bit with it. So make sure that you do explore. And again, thanks for watching.